Welcome back to Bagel TCG. Today we're going to be doing a speculative tier list for the Rosetta meta, going over the impact of the new cards and the new heroes, how all of that's going to affect the classic constructed meta. Uh, we also just had a massive, massive change with the ban and restricted announcement, essentially banning every major card advantage tool in the game that draws two, plus bonds of ancestry. Um, so that really shakes up a lot of what's going on. Made sense though, as we're seeing the Rosetta cards, some of those draw two tomes would have been a little absurd um, because they are really making it easy to play non-attacks as instants <laughs> or give them go again. So it would have been a little too good, but we're gonna go over the meta here, talk about uh, what it looks like maybe before the Rosetta heroes, and then we'll place the Rosetta heroes last uh, and see where they fit into that meta. Um, Based off the previous meta, Zen was the clear best deck, and then Nu and uh, some of the other backup decks that were trying to beat it, like Victor, uh, Azuri. These were all decks trying to beat Zen, and Ko was kind of in there as well, had an okay matchup. Um, these decks were all trying to beat Zen. Nu was notoriously the best at this. Um, but none of them could quite catch up to him, right? Uh, watching from Hawaii, what's up? Uh, but yeah, no, no one could quite keep up with uh, Zen, right? He just did too much, but they have now taken most of his powerful cards from him. Um, they've taken Bonds of Ancestry, which was his best attack, and they've taken Art of War, which is how he really did his major pop-off turns. So clearly... Uh, Zen is not going to be S tier anymore. Is he A tier? I think that remains to be seen. I think he's a safe B tier for now. Um, he can still do powerful stuff with his Crouching Tigers. Like, all of the Crouching Tiger synergy is still there. Um, so he, I'm sure he'll have some strong stuff he can do with, like, Chase the Tail. That card's always been quite powerful. Uh, maybe you can lean more into the... Majestic Swam. I can never remember the full name because it's five words. But the shifting winds of the something that makes two tigers in hands and then it can be any guard. Um, so he has a lot of synergy still. He's just going to have to focus more on what they actually intended Zen to be, which is a crouching tiger deck, and not what he ended up being, which was a Bonds of Ancestry combo deck. Um, so Zen, I'll put in B tier from net for now. Uh, but let's discuss where these other heroes end up. Not just these other powerful heroes that were in the meta, but overall. Um, starting with Nu. Nu's in an interesting place, because Nu was there to prey on Zen. So, automatically you think she's a little bit weaker, because she uh, yeah doesn't have the deck she's there to beat still around. But Nu is quite strong on her own. And we got some uh, interesting cards to help some of her worst matchups. So if we can go to the spoilers and then scroll all the way down to the expansion slot, there is a full cycle. Oh, there's a lot of cards in this set. There's a full cycle of equipment for Assassin. So these Widow blanks. So Widow Veil, Widow Back, Widow Claw, Widow Web. And they all just say Arcane Barrier 1, Spell Void 1. Um, Wizard was certainly one of uh, the worst matchups for Assassin, Kano in particular. There was very little Nu could usually do, or Azuri, to beat Kano. I, I think a lot of decks, for example, uh, the deck I submitted for Pro Tour and that my teammate took to top four of the Pro Tour had no Arcane Barrier or Oasis Respite at all. Just completely was okay with a 0% win rate into Kano. Now, there are two new wizards in the meta, which would make you think, okay, now we've gone from one to three wizards. This must be really bad. But they banned the most broken stuff for Kano, which was his tomes. So there's no Tome of Fiendal or Tome of something <laughs> the one the other one that draws two I'm not a wizard player um, but they took away six total draw two cards from kano so he is certainly weaker uh and they gave us these new powerful 
anti-wizard tech, right? So Arcane Barrier 1, you could already just run the full Null Rune Suite, right? But now you have Spell Void 1 as well, which is pretty incredible combo. This can act as Null Rune all game until they do their pop-off turn, and then you can use it as Spell Void. You can threaten lethal without having any resources floating and still have a bunch of Spell Void back. Um, so I think, I doubt, I mean, maybe you'll run all four, but I think it's a, maybe a bit wild to run all four. But you'll certainly be running some number of these, um, maybe three of them, I would guess, uh, into Wizard, and that's going to be a pretty significant boost. Um, so all that to say, I think the only severely bad matchups for new now, as someone who primarily was playing new, I think the only really bad matchups are Illusionist, particularly Enigma, um, especially Reality Refractor, Enigma, and any deck with Valiant Dynamo, because that is really hard to beat with the Misblades. I think those are the two main bad matchups. Um, I think Wizards probably acceptable now with the decrease in power they get from losing all their tomes and the additional expansion slot cards. Uh, so I, I'm just going to keep her in A tier, actually. I talked a lot <laughs> to, to just keep her in A tier, um, but I think she lost a good matchup. Um, some of her bad matchups might be getting better, like Enigma and the Valiant Dynamo decks, I think are getting slightly better. Um, but she got some anti-wizard duels. So I'm going to keep both Azuri and Nu and in A tier, because I think the Assassins are still really powerful, but I don't think they're going to, like absolutely dominate the meta. Um, on to KO though. I do think KO uh, might be S tier again, or at least the highest deck in A tier. Um, he didn't have the best matchup into Zen, and now Zen has gotten weaker. Um, and I think he is just always going to be a powerful, consistent deck while he's around. He got nothing taken from him. He just had the rest of the meta get weaker. Like, he still has Blood Rush Bellows, um, and all his power cards, the rest of the meta just had, or a lot of the rest of the meta had its power cards taken. So, yeah, I think KO's in a great spot still. Um, I think I'll just leave him... I guess I, sh I feel like I should put somebody in S tier. <laughs> I, I really don't know if there's an S tier at the moment. Um... But would KO be considered part of it? He's really kind of top of A. But since we're getting speculative, I'll say he's S tier. Um, last in here is Victor. Victor's interesting because he was mostly here to prey on Zen as well, which is why I brought these all in. He ended up having an okay uh, assassin matchup, particularly into Nu. Uh, when he was in that full aggro variant. But Victor's worst matchup for since his release, essentially, or one of his worst matchups, has been KO. And KO was not very popular compared to what he could have been because of how popular Zen was, right? They're both aggro decks. Most aggro players correctly played Zen because he was just so overpowered. So KO ended up not being that popular. Um... Victor was very happy about this because he destroyed Zen, but lost quite hard to KO. Now it's kind of swapped, and that is really bad for Victor. So I think Victor's down... I would have had him in A tier, and I think last meta he was A tier, but I think I'm going to unfortunately have to put him in B tier as long as KO is good. KO is just such a horrendous matchup for Victor. It's, it's just really, really bad. Um... Oh, wow, that went away. Uh, we do have... I'm kind of just going over everything that's not from the new set first, right? In, in terms of... Sorry, new heroes. I'm going over how these expansion uh, slot cards will affect them. So this is a really good Reinar card, Splatter Skull. It says, when this hits a hero, choose a face-down card in their banished zone that was banished by Intimidate this turn, put it into their graveyard. That's really, really good. Really good. A huge payoff for Intimidate that we didn't have before. Um... I think that Reinhardt was already pretty decent, uh, probably at least B tier, because he can kind of beat Victor and the Assassins. But I'm gonna, you know, like I said, this is speculative tier list. These are all early predictions with no data. 
so I get to make my most incorrect predictions. <laughs> so uh, I will put Reinar in A tier, because I think Splatter Skull is just that good. And I think he has a pretty decent matchup spread into the initial meta. Similarly to Ko, he got to keep his powerful draw 2 tool in Blood Rush Bellows um, when the rest of the meta lost their Artivores and Toma Fiendals. So uh, yeah, I think Reinar could end up being really good. Maybe still weaker than his one-armed brother, um, but quite good. Drink him under the table is a new Betsy card. The specialization for her that says, when this attacks a hero, you may wager with them. The winner draws a card and the other hero discards a card. Very good, of course. About as powerful as Weakest Link in terms of, um, yeah, you getting to go up a whole card and they go down a card. So it's double the effect. So quite powerful in that sense. A bit more expensive, obviously specific to her. But this card's really, really good. Uh, is it enough to make old Betsy viable? We need the log weapon, okay? We need the log weapon. I don't know why we haven't had the log weapon, but we need the log weapon. I'll put her in a crazy B tier, all right? She was probably D tier last meta where she belongs, but I have faith. I have faith in drink him under the table, bringing Betsy up to B tier. She is going to the log. Look, she's got the log. She has this log weapon. She's got this massive log weapon. Why does she not? Why can't she play with this? Every art of her has this massive log weapon. We need the, the log weapon to be released. Then I think she's broken. If she gets a weapon called the log that wagers, instant S tier. Uh, <laughs> poor Katsu got Gust Wave of the Second Wind. Um, unfortunately for Katsu, <laughs> he lost Art of War and Bonds of Ancestry. <laughs> Oh, poor Gatsu. Will be our first D tier. Uh, he truly, truly died for Zen Sins. Uh, lost every power tool. He got this cool new combo card that uh, doesn't even work with anything. Because it was here to combo into Bonds. And then Bonds got taken away. Rest in peace, Gatsu. I'm sure he'll be back one day, but it won't be anytime soon. Here we have... Adaptive Dissolver. This is uh, mostly intended for Teclavasin, so we can start with Arcane Barrier. But uh, any of the other mechs can play it as kind of a cool AB piece that they can equip stuff onto because it's base. Uh, I know Dashes were playing some of those three block mech arms, uh, the Evos. And so this could be good, maybe if you need to worry about wizard and then eventually switch into something more powerful, but I don't know why you would, against whip wizard, equipped something on top of this because you need the arcane barrier. Maybe you just play this because it's flexible. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say this really doesn't change anything for, for wizard. Maybe it makes Teclo slightly better. But... Uh, I don't think their wizard matchup changes too much outside of Kano getting much worse, which I think is I think Kano losing six tomes matters way more than them getting adaptive dissolver, honestly. Um, so that's all Mex got, but where are Mex in the meta? Dash, uh, and Dash IO, kind of doing similar things, both being different variants of Mech aggro, have been doing quite well quite well um they had a matchup into zen that was okay the main thing is they lose horribly to new and into assassin but they're not bad into like ko and the brutes and the other decks uh but most notably oh yeah it's not here because it's in a different thing there's an armory deck dash coming up um, this is coming out a little later than the main set, but there are some really powerful Dash IO cards in here. Um, I don't know when this officially releases, unfortunately, because it doesn't say on, on the February page. But there's this card and this card are both absolutely busted for Dash IO. Um, so I'm gonna say 
now is the time to become a Dash IO player and get in, learn the deck before those new cards come out. Because I think they're going to be really game changing. Really, really game changing for her. So now is definitely. Uh, now is definitely the time to get in and learn Dash IO before the new Armory deck comes out. Um, so I'll put Dash IO at A tier with in mind that there's these new cards coming out. Maybe exactly on Rosetta release, she doesn't have that. But I think this is coming out soon ish. I wonder if it's in the product releases already. Uh, upcoming. October 18th. Okay, so it comes out a month after Rosetta. Um, so yeah, a month after Rosetta, Dash IO will be A tier. On Rosetta release, she'll be B tier. I suppose since this is a Rosetta tier list, I should put her in B tier for now. Um, and I think other Dash will stay B tier, but I think Dash IO is going to get a huge boost up to A tier after her armory kit, because so far we've only seen a few cards and they all seem insane insanely good for her so i think dash io will be a real contender for one of the best aggro decks in the format after october 18th um, when her armory deck comes out and i would she's a pretty complicated deck to play so i would recommend picking her up now um if you intend on playing her just to get a good month of practice in before she gets the big boost pun intended i suppose um for other mechs we've got teclo and max all the mechs are not bad uh but i can't like just slam them all in b tier tiers actually need to mean something like overpowered very good above average average below average uh so i'll say both of these guys are average like they can do really powerful things max got supercell teclo got some new powerful evos that have arcane barrier um, I think they're also blue zero cost instance, which is pretty nice. So both of these had gotten pretty nice boosts in uh, Mysteria. They're not really getting anything at all this time around, but the Mysteria boosts are still carrying them to a decent power level. Um, I think in certain matchups, these can both, you know, win like a battle harden maybe. I just think maybe their matchup spread is not consistent enough to take down like a calling or something like that. Um, next up we have plan for the worst. Look at target hero's hand and arsenal. At the beginning of the next end phase, they discard all cards in their hand and destroy all cards in their arsenal. You find traps. Uh, this is obviously a Riptide card. Riptide, I think, is quite good. The Sunflower Samurais with Pablo Pintor on them brought him to Pro Tour, which I think says a lot. Um, and I think both the Rangers are very good right now. Like the Ranger card pool is just incredibly powerful. And I think it feels very weird to put Riptide in A because I think for many months I had him in D tier. Um, but I think he's A. I think there are two very different ways to build Riptide. There is the defensive trap based version and the aggressive version. And it's really hard to know what you're pairing into which causes people to um, yeah, not be able to sideboard correctly unless they know in advance what's going on. Uh, and then we also have Azalea here. Azalea's been good. She's still good. Uh, she has a little bit of consistency issues, but I think she's good. Aurora, best aggro deck? We'll see. <laughs> we're, get, we're getting to the Rosetta heroes at the end, but Aurora's looking pretty strong. Aurora's looking pretty strong. If you stay after the tier list, we will look at deck list as well. Uh, let's see, we have Unsheathed next. This is your next sword attack. This turn gets plus three. And when this attacks, if its power is greater than twice its base, it gets to go again. So this will just always give Centauri Saber go again. Uh, that's mostly what you're going to use it on. Uh, it doesn't work on Dawnblade by itself because I think it has to be greater than twice its base. So it increases to six and needs to be at least seven. But... As you can see by Kasai holding her Centauri Sabres on the art, uh, it's going to be pretty good for her. <laughs> Verdant's aggro. Yeah, maybe Verdant's aggro. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I think Kasai was not really seen in the meta because her 
uh, her Zen matchup is really bad. Looking at the meta now, she has historically one of the best KO matchups. She's probably an okay assassin matchup, or even a very good assassin matchup into new. Uh, her Reinar matchup might be a little rough, but then historically Warrior is pretty good into Ranger as well. So it's, I mean, it seems to me like she beats almost everything here. So I will put her in A tier, which is a huge increase as well from uh, where she was before, which was probably like C tier. I think this is a really new powerful card for her, and I think the meta has shifted to be favorable towards uh to be favorable towards kasai it's an assassin grinder kasai is a yeah it's a really bad matchup for assassin particularly new i think azuri has a better chance because azuri does have piercing on both of her weapons usually which makes valiant dynamos worse but i think it's still kasai favored um we have a bit of a suite of new illusionist cards Calming Cloak, Calming Gesture, and Flutter Steps. Uh, these first two just have Arcane Barrier and then can be destroyed to do certain things. So this one makes your next aura cost less, and this one creates a Spectral Shield. And this one has Ward 1, and when it's destroyed, you can play your next aura. This turn is lower in an instant. These are interesting. Um, maybe they will see play uh, in Enigma... Or Prism. I, I don't really see where these are better than any of their current equipment options. But Arcane Barrier 1 and Ward 1, they have interesting effects that maybe could be broken. I just don't really see where they fit at the moment. Um, but maybe you could find this one, maybe it has some potential. I don't know, the Illusionist equipment suite's already quite good, so... I don't think it'll affect them too much. Also, we got another Dromai card, and Dromai's Living Legend. This is a Briar card as well, so these last two ones are just for Living Legend, so... Uh, we're done with expansion slot stuff after this. Um, and we'll go talking about the rest of the heroes and then the main set. There are- there's gonna be a massive tier list, by the way. I think there's 31 legal heroes after Rosetta. Which is kind of insane. Teching in scale plus Orbito, yeah, yeah. I think that would be helpful into Kazai, especially if it becomes popular. Um, yeah, so Illusionist, I think Enigma was A tier maybe already or a high B tier, but she just had a really bad Zen matchup. But she really does beat up the Assassins pretty well. Um, she's not bad into KO, and yeah, she's. Pretty good into rangers unless they're running Merkmire Grapnel. She is quite favored into the warriors. So I think the Illusionist, both Enigma and Prism, are in a very good spot right now as well. Um, the tier list, like I said, it's going to be quite big because we have 30 plus heroes to go through. But uh, yeah, I think this will be pretty good meta for Illusionist, uh, especially since we have Wizards coming into it. Illusionist does often have a bad matchup into Runeblade. So that, if the Runeblades end up being very good, that could bring them both down a bit. Um, particularly could bring Enigma down. Prism can always do something because she has just these massive Heralds. Um, but it might might bring Enigma down to B tier level if the Runeblades end up being very good. Um, I do think I should maybe bump up some heroes here. Because we're getting some... Pretty big A tier. Maybe we should say some more crazy stuff here. We'll put new and S tier, I think. I think new relative to the rest of the A tier is good enough and can have a good KO matchup. We'll, we'll bump new up a bit. Uh, try to try to make space. I don't think I can just throw everything into A tier. Okay, now let's bang out the rest of the heroes uh, up to Rosetta. Arachne. Just by far the worst assassin. Probably deserves C tier, but I'm just going to continue to disrespect him there. Uh, Bolton is fine, but continues to under-impress me 
in most ways, so I'll put him in C tier and just disrespect him as well. Bravo's hot garbage. Um, like, by far the worst Guardian right now. Dorinthia's okay, uh, but I don't think... I think with the buff to Kasai, with the new expansion card, I think you'd rather play her as a Valiant Dynamo deck. Also, Kasai is a bit less weak to Siren's Call, because she plays less blues. So I don't think Dorinthia is the best place to be. Fi is dead, just like Katsu, Kano. I mean, I had him in A tier before, but he just had so much banned. I'll put him down to a super disrespectful D tier. Levia's been fine. Uh, she's probably still fine. Uh, but I think she's probably the weakest brute now. Olympia's garbage as well. Um... What do we have left? The two older rune blades. Uh, so we've got these are kind of interesting because they both got some decent buffs with this set. Um, I think, based on what we've seen, these are both getting a pretty decent buff. Um, but they did lose cash in. Well, Viscera lost cash in, which is pretty good for him. And Vincent, I've always been a little under impressed by. I think I'm gonna give. I mean, I just wish he had a better weapon. <laughs> I I really want to put him in A tier and make all the Runeblade fans happy. But I think I'll put him in B tier, unfortunately. I'll put Vincent in C tier. I think she still uh, doesn't have all the consistency she would want. Now let's talk about Rosetta. So Rosetta brought a whole lot of cards and four new heroes to the meta, um, bringing back talents uh, in a big way, and particularly some of the strongest talents the game has ever seen. Uh, ice is still probably the strongest talent, and of course they avoided ice this time, um, but the elemental talents in general are really strong. There's quite a lot of banned heroes, or living legend heroes I should say, with the elemental talents, so it's definitely a set we should look at pretty seriously. You can see they held back in some areas for making it too broken, particularly both the new weapons are not very good for the rune blades uh, compared to Rosetta Thorn that we got the first time around. Um, but overall, the set does seem like it'll have some power to it. So we'll start with the rune blades. Let's start with Aurora actually. Uh, Aurora is the essence of lightning rune blade, so it can play lightning cards and elemental cards. Um, she has the classic 440. And she has once per turn instant. For two resources, you can create an embodiment of lightning token. Activate this only if you played a lightning card this turn. Now embodiment of lightning card tokens just uh, pop when you attack with a weapon or an attack action. Uh, and gives it go again. Do they pop on weapons? Maybe they don't pop on weapons. Oh, come on. You don't show me an embodiment of lightning? It's kind of rude. Embodiment. Ah, uh, just attack actions. Okay, I knew I was I was doubting myself for a reason. Yeah, so your next attack action you play destroys the embodiment of lightning and gets go again. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think the text box is semi-useless with how I've thought about building her at the moment. Uh, lightning, historically, has been able to play almost entirely zero cost. And you can see both of her like rare Majestic slot cards. These are all zero cost. Um, if you look to the lightning cards, like zero cost, zero cost, zero cost, zero cost, zero cost, zero cost, zero cost. They're either zero or one, right? Now, if you build the deck more with blues in one cost, then you can consistently have it so you have the one cost and then you have the embodiment. Of course, uh, also combos well with the weapon. Um, then it's... It puts the tears... <laughs> okay, we're figuring out as we go, all right? Uh, yeah, the weapon does, of course, intentionally go well with the hero ability. Um, you can use a blue to evenly attack for two go again with Starfall. Uh, if you've played a lightning card this turn and make an embodiment. But turning a blue into two damage plus an embodiment, still not that great. Especially if you don't really need the embodiment that much. I would much rather like 
turn a blue into four damage, then turning it into two go again plus an embodiment. So I don't think that's what's going to matter. I think what's going to matter is how broken the rest of her card pool is because lightning cards are just insane rates. Like her specialization arc lightning is incredible. It's zero cost, go again. Whenever you go again this turn, deal one arcade damage to any target. The next action card you play this turn gets go again. And this counts going again on weapons, going again on equipment. So this can end up dealing like five, six arcane damage in little pings of one. And then it also gives something go again. So it's doing so much for one card that it's really good. Looking at burn up shock, this is zero cost, deals one damage right away. And then the next time an attack you control hits, deal four. So this is a zero for five. Of course you have to hit. Um, but you'll play this against other aggro decks primarily that don't want to block you. And then this is a zero for five, which is really incredible. So she has the really good rates. Um, I think she will be one of the premier aggro decks. Do I want to put her in S tier? Uh, I think her biggest weakness is that she blocks pretty poorly overall. Looking at a lot of the good lightning cards when I scroll down. We look at stuff like Fry, that doesn't block at all. You're going to be playing some number of uh, instants that don't block, but we have a lot of like, you'll play this which blocks for two, this which blocks for two, this instant you'll play which doesn't block at all. Uh, so I, I don't think she's going to block very well, and Disruption is quite strong at the moment. She'll be pretty weak to the weakest link, to Command and Conquer, stuff like that. Um, and she'll have to really rely on her equipment suite to get her through those. She doesn't have like as broken of an equipment suite as Zen or KO. Um, so I would love to just slam her in S tier because she does a lot of damage. But I think she's more like an A tier, maybe a B tier. Uh, she does a, some of the highest damage output in the game. Like I think she will be hitting the ceiling for the meta for damage output. Um, but I think she's kind of similar to Dash IO in the sense that she's like this full glass cannon, uh, does a massive amount of damage, but you throw one command and conquer at her and she's not having a good time. Um, so I'll give her a really optimistic A, um, but I don't know how well it's gonna work out. Looking at our other rune blade, Florian, he has a fairly disappointing weapon as well with Rotwood Reaper. Uh, it's a two for two damage, which is horrible. If you've played or created an aura this turn, it gets plus two. So conditional two for four, and two for four is just fine. So it's conditionally okay and normally horrible. Hero ability though is very interesting. In Classic Constructed, it says if there are eight or more earth cards in your banish zone, Florian gets if you would create one or more aura tokens, instead create that many plus one of each of those tokens. This is really, really, really powerful once turned on. Every time you would make one rune chant, you make two. Uh, every time you'd make one embodiment, you make two. A vigor, you make two. Really, really powerful. The main question is how fast can you banish eight earth cards? The answer is uh, probably not as fast as you need. Like you can definitely banish eight earth cards but can you banish them uh, quick enough to compete with the rest of the meta? Probably, maybe. Um, he has quite a good suite of decompose cards here with Felling the Crown and Plow Under. Uh, decompose, of course, says when this attacks, you can banish two earth cards and an action card from your graveyard. Uh, if that action card's earth, then you'd need to play three of these, essentially. You'll essentially always have to play three decompose minimum because then you'll be banishing nine cards and you need eight of those nine to be earth cards. Um, of course, you have to get those earth cards into your graveyard first uh, by blocking with them most of the time or playing with them, playing them out. Uh, but yeah, it is quite slow. You have a blank hero ability until then. I think the decompose cards are good but he does struggle to like use all his cards that well. He also can make these embodiment of earths, but doesn't have a lot of three block non-attacks that are great to use them effectively. 
Certainly no Briar. Um, I've also looked at using him with Channel Mountain Heroic, but without access to the Lightning cards, he really has a low amount of action points. And if you look at his Earth card suite that he's going to try to use, it blocks really, really poorly. I mean, his only three blocks are his Majestics and Autumn's Touch, essentially. So I'm not that confident on Florian. I will give him an optimistic B. Um, he might end up realistically like C, but I think I'll once again be optimistic and put him in B tier here. Um, I really think the Rune Blades are lacking like a great weapon. Like their best weapon is probably Reaping Blade right now, which is uh, one resource for three damage. Just like on rate and fine, but really nothing particularly special. Um, and compared to a lot of the other weapons in the game, can be quite poor. Um, although maybe it'll be good with Verdance if Verdance ends up being pretty good. Speaking of, let's go look at the wizards. Are they all up here at the top together actually? I think they might be. Yeah. So Verdance has a similar text box to Florian where she also requires eight or more earth cards, but she gets whenever you deal or whenever you gain life, sorry, during your turn, you may deal one arcane damage to any opposing hero. This is pretty strong. Uh, getting double value from gaining life is great. For example, her specialization, one, two, gain three life and have go again. It's already like playable, I'd say. Uh, it's like a slightly weaker Sigil of Solace, but it also blocks three and is a blue. So I think most decks would be happy to play this. At least defensive decks would be pretty happy to play this. But once her hero ability is on, it also shoots from one arcane every time. So then it's a one for three life and three damage with go again. So one for six go again. Just pretty incredible. It's also arcane damage, so it's not as easy to prevent for a lot of decks. Um, she has this powerful Majestic as well, where you amp, which means your next arcane deals that much more damage, where X is the total life you gain this turn. So this can be a huge finisher uh, by, you know, you're always going to get the one here, but if you've gained six other life, then you're uh, hopefully dealing damage every time you gain that life through your hero ability. So you'll deal seven damage or whatever through the life gain. Um, and then you'll also boost your next arcane by seven. So rampant growth life is going to be probably a main finisher for Verdance. Um, I don't know how she's going to be built specifically. You're going to need some number of attack actions mixed in because most of the decompose is these attack actions plus the uh, root bound carapace, which I think will of course be played as three of as well because it's a four block defense reaction that decomposes, but that's the only decompose card that's not an attack action. So you'll still need to play probably felling the crown and plow under, for example, and you'll likely play cadaverous tilling as well. So you will have some number of attack actions mixed in. You might play fruits of the forest too, um, because this can be a three for seven attack, or you can also discard it to gain life, which is great on the first turn um, and can shoot for one arcane. So it becomes a, uh, Gain two life, deal one, which is kind of on rate with Sigil of Solace um, when you have your hero ability on. It also turbos uh, earth cards into your grave to be banished. So I don't know the ideal way that Verdance is going to be built, but I do see a lot more potential in her. She also has a weapon that I quite like, Staff of Verdant Shoots. Uh, the rate when you actually uh, activate it is quite bad. It's just three resources to amp one with go again. So you're trading a whole blue for one damage, which is quite poor. Um, but the second part says when one or more earth cards are pitched this way, the next time you deal arcane damage this turn, create an embodiment of earth token. Now embodiment of earth, like I was saying in Florian are not as helpful because he plays quite a lot of two block non-attacks. So it just kind of bumps them up to three. Um, but Verdance is going to be playing mostly three block non-attack actions like Heart of Candle Hold, and then they become four blocks once you have Staff online. I don't think you're going to be doing this every turn because the rate is quite bad, just a blue for amp one. You're probably never going to do it, of course, when you're just attacking with a decompose. You're just going to be blocking with two cards and then swinging with this. Very like Icelander style. I do think she's going to maybe feel a little like Bull Lander because you're going to be playing some number like nine to 12 copies of three cost attacks. 
So it's going to be a, a little, I mean, if you liked Bolander, you'll probably like Verdance. Um, but when you want to go for Arcane Damage, or if your opponent slows down a little, you can use an extra card that you have, an extra blue, to uh, let you block better on the next turn. So if they go to set up, you know, they use like a three card hand and then Arsenal, and you can then have an extra card to staff a Verdant Shunes. When they go for their five card hand, um, you'll have that embodiment of Earth to survive it significantly easier. So pretty interesting weapon that won't be used every turn. It's not going to be like some heroes like KO that wants to be using it every single turn for the most part. Um, but it will be nice when you have the extra card to use it. All that to say, I think Verdance is good. I think I'm feeling good about Verdance. I will put her in A tier. I think she'll be one of the better defensive decks in the meta. Um, she could be S tier. Sorry, I'm just thinking about it further and like... Did she destroy these two heroes? She might beat Kao quite well, because Kao historically has had a little bit of trouble if he's getting like fatigued. Not that he he can play around it, of course, like he can play cast bones and stuff, but maybe you play like scours. Kind of interesting. I'll put her in a confident A tier position. Um, but now we're going to end with Cilio. Uh, I've just been calling him Silly because I can never spell his name correctly. Actually, I think my image file of him is spelled all wrong <laughs> now that I see his name again. Um, but he is the other wizard. This one's the lightning wizard. He has a simpler ability in a way. It just says, once per turn instant, discard an instant, draw a card. So you get a filter, an instant, once per turn, on your turn and your opponents, discarding it and drawing a card. That is pretty cool. Um, his weapon also says, if you control an ore permanent with sigil in its name, this costs one less to activate. And it only costs one, so it'll be free if you ever have a sigil permanent out. And it says Amp X, where X is the number of lightning cards you played this turn. Now this is like by far the strongest weapon by itself in the set. Because I don't think either of the Runeblade weapons are very good. I think Verdance's weapon will be occasionally good, depending on the game state. But I think Cilio's weapon is going to be the one that you want to activate essentially every turn. Since you can often make it free you get such a big payoff for playing your sigils because they also kind of give you a free resource. And this can become a massive amp. Where X is the number of lightning cards you played this turn, he's certainly going to be a glass cannon build because it pays you off so much. You're really not going to want to do any blocking with the Cilio, um, or at least very little blocking, I think, because you're going to be able to just play three lightning cards out, four lightning cards out, uh, amp four and then throw a massive uh, arcane damage spell at the end. Um, so it, you just get such a payoff for keeping all your cards with Volzar that I don't see him that interested in blocking. He gets some pretty powerful sigils too, like a specialization. Uh, when this leaves the arena draw card, uh, it does destroy itself at the beginning of your action phase, but you have ways to bounce sigils. So you could play this, and then before it goes and destroys itself, you could bounce it back to your hand. Um, drawing a card and yeah, just basically being a zero cost draw card that also makes your weapon free, which is pretty insane. We've got some powerful arcane spells like Comet Storm Shock to really throw massive chunks. I mean, this is four resources for six damage or two for five, um, but this can really use your amp pretty well. And then if we scroll down to the lightning cards, they printed some, I have to say, quite strong lightning cards um, in this set. We have Flash of Billions, which lets you return that aura to your hand. Like I was saying, when this defends, you discard a lightning card. If you do return an aura, you control. So this lets you bounce that uh, specialization sigil, which might be a good reason to play it. Um, Eclectic Magnetism is a really powerful Majestic. Once attacks, you play, may play a non-attack action card. This chain link is lower instant. So throwing out those big arcane spells for free. Uh, Gone in a flash when this attacks, the next time you play an instant card this chain link, you may return this to its owner's hand. So uh, you get to play it another time if you play this and then a sigil and then play this. Uh, yeah, really incredible stuff. The first time you deal damage to an opposing hero each turn, draw a card, also counts on their turn. So if you instant speed some 
arcane damage at them on their turn, you can draw like two cards off of this. Um, so the lightning card suite, I think, is measurably better than the uh, Earth suite, in my opinion. This set, the Earth suite, is also quite good. Like I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. Some of these, these majestics are both really good. Rootbound Carapace is pretty nice, but some of these majestics and even rares, like Electromagnetic Somersault, it's kind of a zero block six if you return two, three blocks that you blocked with to your hand. Um, so there's some really, really powerful stuff in the Lightning Suite. Uh, and I think Acilia will be able to do some massive glass cannon damage. I think most of the Kano players are going to become Acilio players because I think he can do those huge combo th kills that they're used to doing without needing all the tomes. So I will put him in A tier as well. Now, maybe we should reorganize this a little um, now that we're near the end uh, and kind of establish where everyone will end up. Um, I would like to build a bit of a bigger S tier here. Something like this. Rearrange that. Problem is these wizards are going to have a lot of trouble into the illusionist, which makes me a little sus on them. I feel like the illusionists are going to be quite good. But if the illusionists are good, it's a bit of a triangle meta, right? If the illusionists are good, the rune blades can beat them, right? Rune blades have a very favored matchup into illusionists. And if the illu if the rune blades are good, maybe the wizards beat them. But the wizards lose to the illusionists. A little hard balancing this top. I think these three heroes will end up pretty good. I think Prism as well. I'm not really sure on like these four at the f these five at the front. I do think Viscerai will be a pretty good Rune Blade as well. I think these are probably all staying in A tier. Um. Yeah, you think I wait? Rate Viscerai too, or Kasai too high? I think Kasai is probably too high as well. I think Kasai, uh, I'm mostly thinking about Kasai beating these two. She does lose pretty horribly to Illusionist, in particular to Enigma. Uh, I don't think she loses that hard to Prism. Yeah, Enigma, yes, Prism not. Yeah, I think she beats, or not beats, but has an okay game into Prism. I think Enigma is pretty bad. Um, maybe it's just a huge A tier. I think we'll stick with this. I really think any of these five heroes at A tier. I think well, okay. To be to clarify, when I make a tier list, I think anything in A tier or S tier could win a calling or pro tour, etc. Uh, I think S tier just maybe is what people build around more. Like these are the really uh, powerful parts of the meta. And I think this is what we will see the most. But I think all of these heroes are really strong. Like Azuri won the Pro Tour. And I still think Azuri wasn't the best or top five hero. But I think Azuri was just a good meta call. And meta calls are really important in Flesh and Blood. So just because I put a hero in A tier doesn't mean it can't win a Pro Tour or calling if it's a good medical if you think okay these are the top four heroes but my hero beats these two really well maybe it's still worth bringing right i think c tier and d tier are going to struggle to win anything and then b tier is kind of that middle tier where maybe sometimes you can win a top event but maybe sometimes you'll just do horribly <laughs> so i think that's the uh like these are the two tiers that are really strong these are the two here tiers that aren't as good and then this tier in the middle is kind of figuring out where it's going to end up. Zen is a lower tier. I think that remains to be seen. Zen still has a lot of powerful stuff. The Mystic class is just really good. Like Mystic is uh, one of the best talents in the game for sure since they've added it. Uh, you can see like I have an S tier and an A tier and I've thought about putting this Mystic in the S tier. But we'll call the tier list here. 
for the first tier list of Rosetta. Pretty speculative. Um, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.